um, welcome everyone to today's uh, talk or you know panel discussion on uh, criminalizing dalit descent uh, we are looking in particular um, we have an excellent team of uh, speakers with us today um, and um, uh, we are looking in particular at the bima korigao case so this so this um, meeting I should I wait for the countdown to completely go down or sorry. Uh, quickly, no, because it's plugged into that side. Hi, everyone. I just want to make sure, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Um, 
we are finally live now. Um, today's uh, panel uh, discussion on criminalizing Dalit support is hosted by Academy Mob. And um, I think I want somebody to pick up the mic. Uh, uh, so, um, and uh, we're going to be discussing the Bhima Koregao case uh, and the, uh, yes, uh, that's uh, the Bhima Koregao case. So we've got a panel of four experts with us today and you'll be hearing from them shortly. And the reason for, uh, you know, uh, the magazine coming together and for holding this panel is to basically look at the fact that why does the state uh, going after Dalit dissenters, why is the state trying to um, stitch up uh, Dalit activists and anti caste activists under the broad rubric of, you know, a terrorism case, especially a case that, you know, has um, comes under the unlawful prevention activities, uh, UAPA, and also it's the same case in which they earlier spoke about a plot to murder the prime minister. So why is it being made so sensational? And um, so I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists that you're going to be meeting today. And uh, then um, I would, uh, because I cannot stop talking, and that's, I think, why they decided to make me the moderator so that I speak the least amount possible. I'm going to give you a little bit of my own thoughts, and then we're going to listen to the panelists. So the two, the four experts that who will be talking with you today are uh, Nihal Singh Rathod, uh, who is an Ambedkarite practicing law in Nagpur and is the joint secretary of the advocate uh, Surendra Gadling Defense Committee. Uh, then we have Buffalo Intellectual who prefers to remain anonymous. He's a social science professor whose research looks at the intersections of caste, gender, and urban studies. Uh, he he uh, has a background in media studies and currently runs an Ambedkarite social media, media handle. I think a lot of us know him through Instagram. And then there's uh, Santwa Nakumar. She's a senior research fellow and doctoral candidate at the Center for Women's Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, she's a Dalit legal scholar with a specialization in uh, human rights law, and her research deals with legal analysis of violence against Dalit women, Dalit women's identity in contemporary India, and uh, jurisprudential analysis with the theory of intersectionality, critical race theory, and critical legal studies. And uh, finally, we have uh, Siddhesh Gautam, who is a Delhi-based illustrator and educator who identifies himself as a storyteller and is so, uh, experts who will be talking to you from various different perspectives today. We're just going to listen to them. And before that, I just wanted to make a mention of the famous Bhima Koregaon 16, um, the activists and intellectuals and lawyers um, and um, a majority of whom also happen to be Dalit, um, who are today imprisoned. And uh, some of them have been in prison for about two years and more now. And so their names are as follows. So uh, it's Father Stan Swami, who's leading the list and is possibly the oldest of the prisoners. Uh, there's Hani Babu, who's a professor at Delhi University. There's journalists like Gautam Navlaka. There's uh, Dr. Anand Teldrute, who's an academic um, and an intellectual and an activist. Then there's uh, Vernon Gonzalez, then there's poet Varvara Rao, there's uh, the activist Sudha, Sudha Bharadwaj, there's journalist Arun Ferreira, then there was Rona Wilson, who was actually running the campaign for the release of political prisoners. Then there's uh, Professor Shrima Sen, uh, activist uh, Mahesh Raut, and then uh, Lois Surendra Gadling, and then editor and writer Sudhir Dable. And there's also members who happen to be cultural activists, but also uh, very much at the forefront of the Dalit resistance today, uh, Jyoti uh, Ragoba Jagdab, Sagar Gorke, and Ramesh Gaichor. And um, uh, having introduced them, um, I just want to say a very brief, uh, few brief points. Uh, one of that is that um, the manner in which the systematic uh, targeting uh, in the Bhima Koregal cases happened is an attack on the Dalit movement, but it is an attack on the Dalit movement at a very particular historical conjecture, especially when um, the Dalit movement itself was, you know, trying to articulate and find its feet both against, you know, uh, systemic uh, land grab to, uh, by the corporates, you know, under the guise of the state, or when they were trying to stand up for worker rights, or when there was this idea that, you know, they could do something much more on a na national level. And there's also this perceived ideological threat on what the Dalits represent or what the Dalit assertion would represent, because, um, 
if we could argue very easily that India's de facto working classes happen to be Dalit Bahujans, but primarily almost a lot of Dalits are found in working class um, professions, which also leads to uh, how do corporates view that and how do these corporates in turn feed the media ecosystem, which is basically making this trial into a media trial. And we're seeing that over and over again. And also my, my own personal preoccupation with this case, especially in the light of the arsenal information that you know the original complaint um the talks about the assassination of we or more planted on the computers of their own uh through or more which is uh which is very suspicious but it also tells you about how does big tech and surveillance capitalism and hindu fascism all of them have how they come together so i'm not going to speak much of that but all of these questions are going to be coming up so i would invite buffalo intellectual to now go first and actually um each uh, of the four experts would have 10 minutes to unpack this case for us and especially much more than the case Tell us why is it that the state is so intent on criminalizing Dalit descent and you know Dalit resistance, and so I call upon Buffalo Intellectual to go first. Um, thank you, Meena. Uh, Jabim, friends and listeners, and uh, a big thank you to the organizers for this invite and this opportunity to speak on this topic with such a talented panel. <laughs> Um, but um, starting out, I feel a little unequipped to speak on the topic of criminalizing Dalit descent and leaders since I'm neither Dalit, since I come from a Bahujan background, nor am I coming from a legal training. Um, but as a sociologist, what I can do is try and give a structural commentary on the idea of dis descent and caste and how it pertains to the, to the Indian state. See, one of the first things that when we are going to have any conversation on dissent, we have to understand that dissent by definition implies a power differential. There has to be a power differential between a, a, a hegemonic uh, order and, and, another, and another group which is being uh, uh, persecuted. If there is no power differential, then there is agreement and there cannot be dissent. There has to be a, a distinguishing factor between the power source, the hegemony, and the oppressed. Now, if that is a very basic idea of dissent, then within South Asia, within what we call the Indian nation today, within the last three, 4,000 years, if we see which social structure has been the cause for the biggest power differentials, and uh, uh, there has been enormous body of work, of course, uh, you know, led by uh, some of the pioneering work by Baba Sahib himself, which locates caste as a key variable in determining the material power relations within South Asia. So a lot of issues of, uh, uh, of labor, gender, nation, uh, 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 all manners of things at its core, when we dig past the surface, we find the the the, the horror of caste at the at the at the base of all of those things. So, if we are going to try, then try and have a conversation about dissent, we have to understand that at its core, it comes from material relations of power. Now, if caste is the material uh, uh, you know uh, material driver of of the hegemonic order then we have to kind of look at our present scenario. One thing that we have to understand very, very clearly is that identifying yourself as an anti-BJP person or an anti-Sung person is not necessarily the same as being anti-caste. I repeat, being anti-BJP is not the same as anti-caste. And most oppressor caste or upper caste or savarna, dvit savarnas, however you want to classify them, the vocal liberals who consider themselves the dissenters often share the same caste privilege as the ones in power. So first of all, we have to be very careful when we try and uh, un unpack who's actually the hegemonic order and who's dissenting. In the case where the 
the regime in power is also driven by the same oppressor caste interests and uh, a lot of the liberal intelligentsia which is sitting in journalism which is sitting in policy which is sitting in legal circles are also coming from the same oppressor caste uh, privileges then you cannot necessarily truthfully speaking say they are the dissenters because both are materially invested in keeping the same caste hegemonies intact they just have disagreements on policy not caste hegemony and this is an important difference when you're talking of upper caste liberals who are uh, speaking out vocally against uh, uh, the bjp the difference is on policy not on caste hegemony when it comes to caste hegemony they have the common interest so it's like watching two branches of the same privileged caste order like having a squabble internally but when it comes to you know upsetting or challenging or dismantling the hegemony of caste and actually empowering or giving a a a, a platform to the dalit and the bahujan uh, populations of this country there we see a remarkable convergence between what the bjp is saying and what bjp is most vocal uh, upper caste liberal critics are saying so in in that sense it really it really exposes uh, uh, where things stand so first of all can we truly consider the upper caste liberal quote unquote dissent as truly dissenting if it is not trying to annihilate caste is it really dissenting it's it's a struggle between two groups of the same hegemonic privilege this is where uh, we need to look at dalit dissent or bahujan dissent as an epistemologically different challenge because it threatens not just the bjp but it also threatens the liberal upper caste networks of the so called quote unquote progressive oppressive caste dissenters that's where it is a radically different imagination it does not tolerate either dictators nor messiahs and that is why it is it 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 threatens the 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 um it threatens both orders right um and uh, this is why dalit or bahujan dissent or ambedkari dissent is structurally explosive because it is not looking to replace one uh, you know uh, uh, one oppressive bjp rss whatever you want to call it one formulation with this uh, other liberal intelligentsia it looks at their entire system and tries to tries to append it tries to overthrow it uh, and this is why it is explosive it is radical and hence it needs the full strength of the system to be discouraged now what is this full strength of the system why you know i think one of the key questions of of, of our discussion today is why is the state coming down so heavily on on dalit dissent or bahujan dissent it's because it not just threatens the 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 conservative order it also threatens the liberal upper caste order and therefore we need to use the full might of the system and what is this full might you just need to look at the caste profile of the judiciary the caste profile of the mainstream media networks the 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 hegemonic power systems within the bureaucracy these are all uh, pillars of the system which hold up this extremely brutal violent casteist national apparatus alive and uh, uh when it when when something so explosive which threatens uh, uh the the caste hegemonic order comes in you suddenly start seeing solidarities across these uh, institutions so the way dalit dissent or bahujan dissent is framed is very important because it will be framed as dangerous quote unquote illegitimate or quote unquote not organized or you know or or something which is um, which doesn't enjoy the same legitimacy as a a a uh, sophisticated upper caste liberal editorial driven uh, 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 agenda and in this dissent you can see the action also when when uh, upper caste liberal uh, dissenters uh, even earn the ire of the uh, 
when cases are filed against them the judiciary is also sort of sympathetic i am with exceptions i'm saying of course uh, there are people who have suffered but there's there's a softness to it the media will also frame it the headlines will frame it with a certain softness it's almost like oh you're going after these people now oh my god like you know it's it's almost like you don't go after these set of people you go after the dangerous dissenters and who's the dangerous dissenters the dalit the bahujan who are epistemologically approaching resistance from a very different uh, uh, sense and in a in a way this framing of dalit or bahujan dissent as dangerous is itself very decisive because that frames the response and the public perception and that is a big reason why a case like bhima koregaon isn't being laughed out of court for a long time it drew a uh, strange silences it drew uneasy silences from huge sections of mainstream media even today actually and uh, sections of judiciary who were uneasy to talk about it because it was like oh this is dangerous and this is not legitimate instead of laughing it out of the court because the way it has been framed is is where the key is and it has been framed as dangerous because it is dangerous to the the caste hegemonic order and uh, i think i'm just running out of time so in conclusion i will just like to repeat as a as a statement that you know we have to be very careful that anti bjp is not anti caste and if you're not anti caste you're not truly dissenting i think that's my uh, last word uh, on 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 my allotted time Mina, I think you're on mute. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I'm th thankful to you, uh, Buffalo Interaction, for that uh, contribution. Uh, and I'm really interested uh, in the fact that you know you you were asking this important question on what holds this uh, caste structure alive, which is the state machinery, the judiciary, the media, and all of this, and which is why all of them are you know in this absolute coll uh, collation of sorts to go. We will. Uh, I want to listen actually to Sidesh Gautam before we intervene and you know talk with each other. Uh, Sidesh, can you go ahead and talk to us in particular about you know your uh, inputs on this? Uh, thanks, Mina. Thanks everybody uh, for being here and for for inviting me here. Uh, uh, Buffalo Intellectual has uh, talked uh, thoroughly about uh, dissent, you know, and I would like to you know uh, talk about Dalit Bahujan Adivasi dissent or. Uh, and basically, primarily, uh, you know, around Dalit descent. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm 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 an artist. I'm I'm a creator, and I'm a storyteller. So, you know, I do not see things, you know, in a very uh, in a very political spectacle. I see things as a storyteller. So, uh, you know, when I connect dots uh, in politics, everything everything for me is uh, storytelling, kind of a storytelling. So, when I connect uh, connect these thoughts, you know, and and these uh, these points that are uh, coming up these days, you know, I I I kind of you know uh, uh, I'm forced to or I'm bound to you know reflect back and and you know see and you know see what happened in the past, and uh, and what really is the descent, you know, and. Uh, according to me you know this dissent is nothing more than an, an an expression an honest expression and it is called dissent uh, just just like buffalo intellectual said that you know it is called dissent because it is you know uh, unsatisfactory for you know all a, a plethora of people who are you know upper caste or you know who are in in the uh, uh, in the in the uh, position to uh, to influence and and to control uh, the country so you know i'll i'll, I'll uh, since you know uh, ravidas jayanti was uh, not uh, you know it, it was just two three days back and i would take this example of sant ravidas and you know uh, like him you know he was uh, a part of nirban movement in and a poet you know who was uh, writing couplets and songs and singing songs you know uh, around caste and for those who say says that you know caste is a western concept ravidas lived before uh, uh, the westerners came to india so you know he talked about caste he talked about the corrupt priesthood and the you know the idol worshiping and the, the adultery in in the religion and the orthodoxy uh, uh, what happened to ravidas you know he he was being celebrated he was being accepted mira bai became his uh, a disciple but what what happened really you know uh, he was basically killed by the priests and uh, what what they you know and they framed this new story you know this story of 
you know, him trying to prove himself uh, as a Brahmin. So, you know, he penetrated his skin and, you know, there was a golden thread, uh, the, the golden Janeu appeared and, you know, they all came to know that, you know, uh, that this guy was really a Brahmin. Uh, but the thing is, you know, uh, it, for me, it, is, it, it was a merciless uh, uh, killing of, of a saint. And, and you know, uh, when, when, when if, if we move forward, you know, we, we come to the time of the Fule's. Uh, when our, uh, you know, where our, uh, uh, our masters are different, you know, Fule's uh, too, you know, just expressed. I, I, I do not really see dissent because they were just expressing what, uh, what they, you know, what everybody really expresses, you know, what everybody really wants to express. So they expressed through their own writing, their own uh, activism and their own, you know, a way of educating people. And what happened to them, you know, they were, uh, they were uh, uh, laughed at their whole life, you know, they, they were little kids throwing cow dung and uh, stones, pelting stones on these uh, people and th their life, you know, if, if you imagine their life, you know, a life like this, you know, when you're doing something for the public and, you know, this is how you're being responded with, you know, you, you like I might not have, you know, uh, uh, been able to carry forward with that, but they, they, you know, they did their duty and uh, Savitri Mai, she died, you know, serving people uh, during the plague. We move, for, you know, but, but you know, this, they, they made these stories around Fulays that, you know, they are the agents of, you know, missionaries, of Catholic missionaries and stuff. Okay, you know, all these stories were made, you know, there is this one woman, you know, who's, who's making the first school of India and, you know, she's a, of course, she's a, uh, you know, how dare a Shudra can, you know, do something like that it was basically that but you know she was made a christian missionary and you know there are all these uh, you know agents of christianity and other things uh, i think when we move forward in the time of periyar and ambedkar you know these people were smart and and they understood you know what happened to ravidas and what happened to the fullays and you know how fullays uh, uh, you know uh, uh, contemporaries like kalak you know they, they actually snatched the mic from them and you know uh, they made their own kind of movement their own kind of movement which was which was revolving around this uh, this caste hegemony but when we see ambedkar and periyar you know they 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 understood this thing and you know they understood then that you know uh, there is this grand narrative that is being made you know whenever we we say something whenever we express so uh, what they basically did is like they did not let anybody snatch the mic they documented their things on their own and uh, you know they started publishing things they started writing things so so it was it was a time you know where, where a lot of you know dalit people and the, a lot of dalit bahujan adivasi people you know we, we we came together and and you know because we also had this you know vision of of this new india that was you know uh, that was going to be made so we were uh, thinking in that direction and uh, uh, and when we see, you know, at today's time, you know, when we see uh, 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 the people who are incarcerated in, in, in uh, Bhima Koregao case, and if, if we also see the Dalit Panthers and, you know, and the stories that were uh, revolving around them. Now, since, uh, you know, the, the masters are different, you know, somehow the masters are, uh, are uh, you know, openly, uh, you know, uh, they're openly, you know, discriminatory and openly casteists. They're openly, uh, you know, Hindutva loving or whatever, you know, they're open to that. And it has been like that for, for a very long time in the, in the Congress of, uh, you know, uh, British India, in the Congress of Free India, in the other parties. And I, I do not, you know, see that they are just open, you know, they are just open about it, which, which uh, gives the state, you know, uh, 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 you know, this kind of a power, you know, to, to do a lot of things with them. And now they again made, made this, you know, uh, this story, you know, just like they did with Ravidas, they did with Fule. There is no innovation in that. They, they just made this grand story, you know, of, of, this, of this kind of a war between, uh, you know, David and Goliath. You know, these people are, you know, directly going to assassinate the prime minister, the head of the state and stuff like that. So, you know, it is something which has been done before and it, which is being, you know, which is continuously being done. And I am really, you know, I'm, I really feel sorry about, uh, uh, about my own community sometimes because you know I I, I do not you know see the, the pain that you know uh, that this community should feel you know I I remember this uh, this time when you know uh, Bhagat Singh was writing against Lala Lajpat Rai but you know when when the time came when when they had to stand with Lala you know he they, he was there his 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 comrades were there. 
and i think our community is is uh, missing that and i don't know why i i do not i have no idea why but but this is something that i'm observing uh, uh baldwin once said you know uh, that you know whenever a, a white man you know raises his voice and you know says that you know give me liberty or give me freedom everybody applauds and uh, you know everybody cherishes that that moment but whenever a black man says the same thing you know word by word you know they are they are, they are uh, you know punished and you know they made an example of that you know this this black man shouldn't do this you know or or any black man shouldn't do this uh, in the future so so i think it is it is very similar in india so it is uh, it is like how dare you how dare you shudras or how dare you dalits you know write such you know such a thing and, and i i do not see anything like because i come from the community and i understand you know that this is this is a lot of uh, this there is a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 weight of uh, of expressions that uh, that has been on us you know we were not able to reflect upon them now when when the time has arrived when you know on on our table we can have fuko and marx and and zizek and or you know everybody from you know from everywhere so you know this this kind of uh, dissent or expression is very natural and uh, it should have been uh, you know handled very naturally or you know in a, in a in a more effective or modern way rather than you know repeating what they have already done in the 14th century and 15th century and you know what uh, ambedkar has already you know told us and periyar has warned us about you know so i think we are somehow you know they are they are doing something which they have been doing for a very long time and uh, uh, now since they have the power to do it freely they are doing it freely and i'm i'm really really troubled uh, uh, i feel troubled because my own community is not standing with them for, for the people who are who are actually the real heroes uh, and who really need our support at this point of time i think yeah, uh, this is all i would like to say yeah uh thank you thank you sudesh um, i'm very happy you spoke about storytelling because uh, i am uh, i come from uh, i come here also as a novelist and when you look at the kind of stories that the police has said in the bima korega case you're like so surprised like how do they come up with such a bizarre plot and you know like yeah just randomly talking about weapons randomly talking about assassinating the prime minister or things like that but actually um, from what i have witnessed of you know uh, dalit atrocity cases i think that this storytelling is intrinsic to actually uh, criminalizing dalit people portraying them as you know dangerous uh, anti social elements for instance i went to this village of villages in dharmapuri which were burnt in the aftermath of you know this uh, uh, this love affair between uh, ilavarasan a young dalit man and divya belonging to the dominant oppressor caste vanyar community and uh, in retaliation to just this two people getting married uh, you know three entire villages of dalit villages were burnt and uh, we would expect that when this kind of uh, an atrocity on the dalit people happens that the accused the people who are sent to prison happen to be the dominant caste the oppressor caste on the other hand the police actually framed cases not only against those who burned the homes but also against young dalit men of the village and they said that you know the, these men were getting militarized they were taking military training on the marina beach so the you know very specific young dalit men from these villages were picked out and the cases were also portrayed uh, for instance they were just you know like fir's filed under the name of murugan in a village in which there would be at least 10 or 12 murugan so you didn't even know who had to appear in court and i think this kind the way in which every every instance in which a dalit actually has suffered uh, witnessed an atrocity become a victim of an atrocity and then goes to this criminal judicial system and then actually has the burden of also dealing with a false case on them and how these false cases are regularly being used to completely you know silence the dalit so that they could not even approach the system and i think that is something that requires extreme unpacking so this has happened right from you know whether we look at the first atrocity which is you know like the first mass massacre in kill even way and then what happened like the law you just that we 
to come there, these two sets of people and then say, oh, you have a case, you just count a case. Now you don't need any justice, please go away. So there is this entire day in which this, you know, this balancing happens and this, uh, and I, this is where I wanted to, you know, talk about the, the, the power of um, make, making stories to, you know, just go after a community. So thank you so much, uh, Siddesh, to talk about this because this is this is everyday knee-jerk reaction. I want to now actually invite uh, Nihal Singh Rathod, who is, you know, um, events advocate Sudhendra Gadling uh, defense committee, but also to speak a little bit more about the case about uh, Gadling's Stella work because he's also represented a lot of uh, Dalit victims in the courts, and we would like to hear more about it. And finally, I, we are all waiting to hear from Santana because she is the only person who is going to talk purely law for us. So yeah, I'm very eagerly looking forward to you. But now Nihal Singh, it's your turn. Thank you, Minaji and uh, Jabin to all. Uh, I think before, uh, actually, this time of 10 minutes is not uh, really sufficient to, uh, you know, even give a glimpse of what Gredling, uh, uh, as a lawyer, as a, as a human rights activist, or as an activist has uh, done so far. But I will definitely uh, try and touch on that issue. Uh, but the topic that we have today, that is uh, criminalizing Dalit dissent, uh, we need to uh, be have one thing in our mind, that law that is a tool in the hands of a uh, ruler, uh, has always been used uh, to suppress uh, in uprising any 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 dissent any uh, particular thing that comes uh, across their enjoyment of uh, power. Uh, first recorded, or say not not first recorded, but in in our country uh, around 1871, or uh, to be very specific, in 1871 they had brought in uh, a law uh, which is called the Criminal Tribes Act, and uh, there under they had. Uh, uh, criminalized uh, nothing less than 198 tribes uh, from across the country, uh, calling them to be born criminals, and uh, many of their activities were then uh, uh, made punishable. Uh, I think perhaps it was uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, the, uh, the first person to raise voice uh, on this issue and uh, call them uh, rather revolutionaries of those time or freedom fighters of those time uh, who were uh, suffering in the hands of uh, uh, Britishers. So I think uh, that is where uh, we can see the reputation of uh, history happening here. Uh, that now uh, another set of uh, law or another uh, method is being adopted to criminalize those who stand uh, in opposition to the power or who's, who dare to speak uh, truth to the power. I also agree with uh, uh, with uh, Bafala intellectual uh, uh, when he speaks that uh, merely being anti uh, RSS or anti BGP. Uh, really doesn't mean anything. Uh, if we look at the uh, uh, look at the work of these people, and uh, more particularly uh, the Elgar Parishad, the incidents that uh, the claim has triggered this uh, issue. Uh, it was organized. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, uh, rather say facilitated by one person named Sudhir Dhawle. Sudhir Dhawle uh, was earlier uh, jailed similarly. Uh, the judgment that came in his uh, case, uh, again under UAP, the judge uh, was baffled to see that person of his stature languishing in jail and being called anti-national and traitor and all. And he says this, these are the people who who, uh, who have kept the democracy alive. These are the people uh, who are speaking on those issues on which everyone needs to speak. Uh, and that's how he came to be acquitted in 2013. And we see that, uh, again, in 2018, he's in jail. What he did in this uh, three, four years time uh, is something that I, I feel uh, has resulted into this uh, this this uh, conspiracy uh, to, you know, uh, stage this case. Sudhir Dhawle was the person who uh, who organized youngsters across the uh, across the state in Maharashtra, at least Rohit Mambula incidents or Rohit Mambula's institutional murder was the first time when uh, Mumbai saw a big protest happening that was organized by Sudhir Dhawle. Then we saw that uh, Ambedkar Bhavan in, in, uh, in, in Mumbai itself was demolished. Uh, it, was, it was seen as a symbol or, or, uh, or as a place for uh, Delhi activists to sit and organize their programs in order to uh, stage protests and all. Uh, that was demolished. There we saw another huge uh, mobilization happening. Then, uh, of course, after Bhima Korega riots, uh, we saw another uh, big mobilization that happened across the state and uh, in uh, parts of nation. Una flocking incidents. 
in all these things he has been consistently threatening and exposing state on the on the lines of casteism on the lines of uh, what exactly it is trying to do or what what it is doing uh, with the with the lower strata people we can see in same lines what surendra gedling had been doing he was a person uh, as i say he he is an institution in himself he has trained many juniors many young lawyers who who who, who wish to walk on his path who, who wish to be like him who rather wish to focus their uh, practice on uh, fighting for the cause of people and not uh, only for making money then there is uh, anand tel tumre of course uh, the person who who has been a uh, vocal critic a critic of uh, um, perhaps all the wrong things and uh, has been a very uh, uh, accomplished person in his personal life uh, the other people like sagar sagar gorke ramesh gai so these are singers who have been singing ambedkar and chau phule uh, and and preaching uh, their ideas to people uh, so these are all the people who have somewhere targeted caste system and have threatened the uh state in its uh, in its in its uh agenda and more importantly agenda that was brought in by bjp and rss so uh the yalgar parishad program that was organized uh on on 31st december 2017 uh was organized at very symbolic place and it was it is called shaniwar wada in pune uh which is which is considered as uh which was rather a palace uh owned by peshwa uh peshwa uh, uh, for those who don't know um uh, was a brahmin uh, 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 minister or commander of uh, maratha king and uh, he is the one who is considered uh, or this peshwa is the one considered who who uh, reintroduced the uh, rigors of caste system in the society uh, as against the uh, work of uh, uh, emperor shivaji and sambhaji who had uh, rather shown uh, that the uh, state or rather the, the ruling dispensation can work uh in better manner if uh, they collaborate with all the caste by uh by uh, eradicating uh, casteism and all so uh organizing a program at such a place which is considered as pride of uh, brahmins or uh, uh so to say uh, of community and there then organizing a program wherein people from various uh, strata of the life are coming to uh, coming forward and speaking against uh, the uh violations that are happening and at the end uh, uh taking the oath that they shall not vote for any person who is affiliated with rss or bjp in the coming elections and then taking the oath that no matter what it takes but we shall uh, uh we shall defend the constitution of india uh in 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 every manner and we will not let it uh, go down so uh, these were the things uh, that that had really shaken the core of uh, uh, society in maharashtra at least i don't know how how uh, it reflected in other states or other uh, the part of the country uh, but yalgar parishad uh, uh, is seen as one place as uh, one program which uh, rather shook the uh, the caste caste society because it it, it was uh, a collaboration of dalits bahujans muslims adivasis uh, uh women uh, farmers uh, workers and all these people coming together and identifying uh their 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 enemies or their their uh, rather the uh, person who has put them in trouble uh, now coming to the issue as to wh- what happens after arsenal uh, report has come which uh, clearly shows which bears out with scientific details uh as to how these documents uh, which are of uh, say plot to assassinate prime minister or plot to do what nonsense those uh, m50 and those weapons uh, those 620 letters that uh, came and created fever around the uh, world all these letters were planted uh, particularly and uh, they were being planted even prior to yalgar parishad uh, had had taken place and then uh, we see that the the pattern in the letters is such that they want to implicate uh, those people particularly who are uh, uh, say are, are uh, as as the fellow uh, intellectual say are the real problem uh, for the for the state and uh, if we see that the the plot to assassinate modi later had been uh, planted long back uh, long, long long much earlier in 2017 sometime in uh, january or february 
and then all these yelgar parishad bima koriga issues were then planted sometime uh, in 2018 uh, little prior to uh, carrying out these raids and arrests the whole thing uh, that we get to see from uh, from what is uh, lacking uh, even after realizing that this is completely uh, fabricated case completely manipulated case where letters were planted in uh, in advance and now uh, these people are being targeted despite that being exposed i did not see any outrage uh, in the society or, uh, or or in the people in that sense uh, and uh, i think i can i can very well relate it with uh, uh, the thing that have happened uh, in recent past uh, one is with disha ravi an activist uh, environmental activist who was arrested and another one is uh, nodip kaur and uh, shiv kumar uh, media was in a way very sensitive and uh, rather uh, had not just media i think i think society at large was uh, feeling more concerned uh, with disha ravi and her incarceration but on the other hand we see uh this nodip kaur who who was uh, brutally assaulted sexually assaulted in the custody and uh, uh, i'm i'm sorry but i i did not see any outrage shiv kumar two fractures so many injuries and uh, <laughs> please i i don't see any outrage where is it coming from we need to be together in this fight against fascism we need to fight it out uh together and and our outrage at least cannot be selective in this uh, uh point of time uh i think uh, uh is my time over i don't know. if it is not uh then i okay fine so uh, i would like to uh say as what what i foresee in the future in, in the coming days with the arsenal report that has come and then uh, other material that is uh, available now which puts a whole thing in a whole case in perspective as to how it is treated and all uh, we have of course approached the high court we are we are challenging uh, the entire prosecution uh, but as we can see it, it may not uh, be a fruits in in the near future uh, we are hopeful that some uh, little relief uh, may come that is in, in nature of sitting for the bail or uh, some some sort of uh, some relief uh, but uh, i think what has happened in between in past 3 years is uh, uh, is extremely extremely gruesome uh, i forgot to mention that in between uh, surendra gedling's mother died uh, of corona his brother at the same time was in icu and then uh, his nephew was uh, also hospitalized in this situation when we uh, sought bail from the court uh, saying that his mother had passed away and let him at least go and be with his family to decide what he wants to do and how he wants to uh, obtain treatment for rest of his family Uh, at that point also court said this is a very serious offense and uh, bail cannot be granted so and same as happened with uh, with sudhir dhawle his brother passed away in between and, and uh, again court did not show any mercy varavara rao we have seen catheter was planted 3 months it was not removed and he was let to die uh, somehow uh, things worked out and he has got bail he'll be out in a couple of days but the thing is uh, there has been so much of insensitivity uh, so much of uh, uh, brute uh, assault on these people i don't know if uh, uh, bail happens in a day or two or in a month or two uh, will uh, will be able to compensate in what all has happened in between but yes we must continue our struggle and we must uh, fight together that's all from me thank you I am mute. I think Meena ji, you are mute. Uh, I invite uh, Santhana to make her comments. Uh... Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for hosting this event and uh, the panel for all their very important and um, interesting inputs. so i'm just going to be today largely i'm going to deal and start off with talking about caste and human rights because descent is one of the basic of most human rights that we uh deal with and are dealing with today um i want to start off with talking about how caste and human rights in an international law framework has been um understood and starting from one of my first points is 
that the in that the indian state has invisibilized caste in the international human rights framework so when we do have this basic international human rights framework and within it from the basics of uh, universal declaration of human rights to the international covenant of economic and social cultural rights and international covenant of civil and political rights now these three basic covenants cover largely all of our human rights which are then ratified by, uh, by other nations all over the world now stemming from this there is another uh, convention which is called the convention of elimination of racial discrimination under which when india ratified this convention it ratified it with a reservation stating that caste is an internal matter and we will not be uh, and we have our own policies and our own laws with an uh, legal framework which deals with these uh, with the with the issue of caste based discrimination and we and it does not come within the purview of race now when the state ratified this there was no hue and cry over the fact that if caste is being invisibilized this is the way the state the indian state has invisibilized caste internationally there is actually not an adequate understanding of caste within even the human rights international human rights framework so within that uh, this is where i would like to start off with and coming from that i start wondering whether when we look at human rights as a framework is it actually is there any true efficacy and adequacy in coming through this idea of the way the indian state has has consciously tried to invisibilize caste for in the post constitutional era uh moving from this i sort of take the argument further and say that there is a limiting language of the uh, you know the, the the there is a limiting language of the law the judiciary and the bureaucracy in and the way the law functions within this so uh when we look at cases of violence uh, violence against dalit women when we look at rape cases when we look at generalized you know everyday violences against dalit there is a tendency where the scst act is not um implemented now there is this near technicality wherein the court the the perpetrators of the crime say when that when they committed the crime they did not know the caste so under that their uh, their uh, punishment gets reduced because the scst act especially in rape cases scst act uh, has a high a, a more uh, grievous punishment right so when you have this mere te technicality and where the court fails to see it where the judge fails to read a case in a particular way in which stating that caste and gen gender are are intersecting and of course it is not possible that that when these cases occur when there are land equations power equations hierarchy equations in a particular area that there is no awareness of caste caste is so intrinsic in our everyday lives how can we not know of of caste we know that our actions reactions everyday habits everything the society functions in a certain way around caste in india so these ways the the technicality of the law in itself is is limiting and then the attitude of the bureaucracy to the judiciary to the to to the legislation is just in in it's like a mere sort of like a it's like a curtain just put on to say that there is a protected legal framework from where i'm going from this is stating that you know there is an intrinsic caste psychology which we which which is what we have to realize and start working towards that if we even though we have a protected legal framework we have constitutional rights we have a means to and it becomes very very personal for dalits in the first place when we look at at the fact that we have this protected legal framework which has come through this you know big uh, struggle this big political struggle by b r ambedkar and and thus there comes this whole emotional connection and belief that the law is is actually a, a social a tool for social change for many of us and utilizing it is the way that we can actually probably go on to a society or annihilate caste or an anti caste society but the problem is that how do you do it when from the time a case is filed and from the constable or the as the si who is registering that fir it ha will does not know or does not have the a sociological understanding or the true understanding of caste because he is coming from his own own uh, understanding of caste so that way is the, the the way the technicality is working is limiting and us and a and a wider understanding of of or a, like i like to say it's like it's a more of a sociological understanding of caste is is missing 
from there on just stating that there is this this intrinsic caste psychology which we cannot deny um i move on to uh, saying that it trickles down deeply into the the the, the uh, psychology of every indian citizen right and when one voices their dissent even if we have solidarity even if we have the solidarity of upper caste uh, people who are with us in terms of voicing our concerns voicing our anger voicing our um, issues the problem is that we're still coming from a place of difference now this is this is something that i i have been thinking about a lot in terms of audrey lord's theory of difference and and she says that you know a first of all it is our duty to claim that there is a difference between you and me and b once i state or once i clarify that difference it is again our duty to um work towards that difference so it's it's a double it's a dual sort of an effort that we're putting in so if we understand dissent from a perspective like that you know if we look at dissent from the perspective that hey a listen to me uh, there is a difference between us and i want to voice it from my personal experience and b it also becomes our duty to fight it but you cannot erase the intrinsic caste psychology you know that's where in, that's where race and caste actually differ because race is something which is on your face in that sense and it starts from there and it trickles down into many other facts caste is it's so it's so deeply embedded in the psychology of the indian citizen because it's not something that you just see in the beginning it's something that is surrounding you every day it's something that is in each and every aspect of your life so now when we look at something like that we you know the 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 problem with with the dalit bahujan dissent the problem with dalit bahujan politics becomes this the people who are actually voicing are uh, voicing dissent in terms of us initially when the, the it did start there is a take over of an upper caste sort of a claim that uh, which is only changing now which only people are coming to accept that let let dalit dissent be dalit dissent dissent by dalits instead of us voicing voicing their uh, voicing their troubles so this idea of difference and dissent is also something that i've been sort of wondering about in terms of this and i would like to open it up for discussion um lastly i move on to this conscious sort of suppression of dalit bahujan dissent which is coming from um, you know the point of all the other speakers that have also mentioned it, that anti caste and anti bjp is probably is not the only thing it is we have to realize that even pre pre independence and post constitutional india both in itself have had casteism um and casteism in the sense that it is deeply entrenched it's deeply imbibed uh, we all function from that we all uh, in in our day in, in in our lives every day and at the end of the day we do realize that at every state state structure everywhere we go whether it be academics whether it be uh, the the whether whether it be law whether it be your political spaces um or you, you know um amina mentioned the corporate culture or the media trials everywhere you see even in journalism The, the 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 dominance is of the upper caste right who's telling these stories who's voicing their opinions truly and really and who who has the control of voicing these these opinions now from this that is where my main point comes in that the dalit bahujan dissent is in itself it it the the the, the struggle is 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 more the process of dissent is deeper it just doesn't it you know the, the education because if you look at it it's only a post constitutional development of actually having reservation actually entering spaces having access to spaces um uh having access to spaces uh, who's accessing most of the spaces within the judiciary within the legislative uh spaces within the bureaucracy media in all the spaces the access or primarily in academics the, the the access is has been through upper caste people they started working and the, gradually everybody and and the dalit voices have started coming in because now of education because now of a certain access to places and spaces it's only now that there is a certain confidence building up which allows us to dissent
right but even then it's it's a very long journey for me it's it's not something that is going to happen overnight it's not going to happen even in the next 10 years or in the next 15 years because it hasn't happened um in the in post constitutional era where where you know we see uh, the struggle that we have for the fundamental rights which have been a massive struggle to get uh article 17 into the constitution of india and make sure that there is the, there is the basis of equality within it so when we look at when we look at it from the perspective of that and we look at it from perspective of access to spaces access to knowledge um access to actually writing and um talking and speaking it's the, it is it is a it is a it is a, it is a, it is a tougher process it's a it's it's a process that will take time it is a process that um has its own um difficulties because we 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 are not born with the idea that we're going to we're going to stand up we are we are oppressed and we've not been oppressed for today we it's an oppression which has been going on for centuries so the way it impacts us is is very different now now breaking out of that oppressive cycle breaking out of that oppressive psychology and actually dissenting and actually saying that there is a difference look at our difference look at what is happening look at how violence takes place look at look at reservation policies look at the way discrimination functions every day in and out of our lives in subtle ways or in direct ways it's very complex so dissent for me is that dissent is speaking up and dissent is is, is a basic human rights which is being taken away um and it's only now that we have to look at it not only from the perspective of uh, that we have rights and thus our rights provide this because it's clearly under threat um your ba- our basic rights are are very much clearly under threat the voicing of of our oppression is being suppressed but it is also very important to uh, realize that this this is a process the process has been much more difficult for us uh, but i'm 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 hopeful <laughs> so yeah that's what i would like to end thank you <clears throat> thank you thank you santan that was very interesting in terms of uh, you know defining solidarity but also talking about intrinsic caste solidarity and i think it's quite inter- intrinsic caste psychology actually in terms of uh, why do they actually uh, you know go so hard after dalit activists and you know uh, dalit movements is also partly to appeal to the caste hindu side you know saying that this state is with you like this apparatus is for you so you know we are not going to tolerate uh anybody challenging this caste system so you know in that sense um, i think dr abedkar so much of his writing revolved around this question of how the magistrate would function how a caste into magistrate would function how a caste into policeman would function and where are their loyalties and this question is in the inner state the in a indian state apparatus i think the loyalty is always with the caste hindu and i think that's also why um they just go so extra hard on you know um, any kind of dalit representation dalit resistance and uh, we see many examples of that so i just want to open the floor briefly i think we are a little bit uh, ahead a little bit over time we now finished our first hour um i'm not sure how long we have but perhaps we are all all night long but i just wanted to start uh, throwing the floor open to questions and i wanted to start actually with the question of um, that santwana but also right from buffalo intellectual sidesh nehal all of them have been talking about which is that what counts as dissent in this country and um, and <clears throat> why is it that that uh, and so i point out again coming back to this bima korega case that was arrested um on the 14th of april and i think for a lot of ambedkarites around the country uh, it's just like you just they just you know this is you know even symbolically this happens to be dr ambedkar's grand son in law and this is ambedkar jayanti and this government is sending him into prison for as a terrorist like whatever we call it we can call it uap but it's basically the terrorism law and like, what does it mean and this is somebody who stood by the constitution who stood by ambedkar who stood by you know whatever ambedkar stood for which is and then you start questioning like this entire system like how could 
this even happen under the same constitution like what are they doing and so i think but i why i wanted to point out anand's arrest was on the day of anand's arrest i think at least 14 parliamentarians all belonging to different caste communities uh, no all belong to sorry no all belonging to dalit groups but coming across party lines so it was i think champion by tirumavala one but there were congress signatories there were signatories from the dmk there were signatories from the cpi there were signatories from literally every, every, every but all of them basically there was even jignesh mivani signed so you had all of these dalit politicians coming together and saying why is this happening and this should not happen the fact that it's happening on ambedkar jayanti is a shame on this nation but this should not happen at all like this is one of the greatest intellectuals that this country has ever produced and then you see that that kind of thing doesn't get any i don't know that doesn't get even as much traction as a kangana ranaut tweet you know like so sorry to to talk about it in this absolutely you know it's it's shameful to make this comparison but that's where we stand so on the one hand you had this each each dalit leader struggle and i think even bi marmi signed this petition so you literally had jignesh mivani toltirma wala one you had um, bi marmi you had every single dalit organization you had prakash ambedkar everybody signing this Uh, and these are the people who immediately say oh but dalits cannot be united you know this is their intrinsic caste is, is always to say oh but you people can't be united but there was unity but they don't take this seriously and i just wanted to talk about this like why do you see that you know when dalits are talking about issues why is there so much silence because i think one thing is criminalization but another thing is also treating them with so much disrespect and disgust and you know not listening to them i guess uh, i i would like to say uh, one thing that you know uh, the promise of ram raj that they you know uh, they generally promise us it's actually here you know we are in ram raj in we are in ram raj where you know a killing of shambhok happens because the shambh, the shambhok is you know trying to get educated like you you know mentioned dr dil tumle and you know uh, uh, the villainization of dalit expression and and you know dalit women and you know how sita how how women are being now when we go back not just even dalits you know if you see the women, how they are treating the women you know about marital rape the the, the recent uh, 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 you know hearing that the news that we came uh, to to see so i think uh, you know this is something which is uh, you know been there for a very long time and i am all uh, and it it Uh, somehow you know it's not just you know we can't really expect a lot from others to be true uh, you know in our own community you know in our own community the youngsters have to you know because this is this is a case which is not very easy it is not very transparent it is you know something in which you know you'll have to go and read thoroughly you know you'll have to understand that the the whole uh, history of bhima koregao the battle of bhima koregao the uh, ambedkar's uh, relation with bhima koregao and later you know uh, the 2018 bhima koregao elgar parishad so you know these threads have to be connected and since you know people are not really interested in uh, you know connecting threads they need that you know spice in their uh, in their flavors you know that that bourgeois uh, in india is you know uh, is still you know uh, i think you know not uh, interested in, in 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 any kind of civil right movement if, if, if i can compare it with, with, with the states with the uh, united states so you know i i think we are not still in in a in a place where we are really you know looking forward to it i do not see the the eagerness you know in in, in the in, in, in the people who are you know uh, preparing for ias and other exams i do not see the eagerness in them you know uh reflecting upon this or you know coming up with uh, ideas of on this so i think it's 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 something you know uh, it's something which is very absurd about uh, you know ourselves if you see mm-hmm. uh i i would like to hear from somebody else also about this uh, before i go on to another question which is uh, Yeah I'd just like to add with Sudesh that uh, I I do believe that this dissent has is definitely been the tool and 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 has been widely used by is has been a tool and power of the privileged and that is how it's only now that we're coming to realize and voice actually through the intellectual discourses that have are being created and this is a moment that and this is a movement that is very new um so yeah i mean that's just something that i wanted to add yes yes um 
So I think we can unpack because when we talk about Dalit descent, uh, we also have to, we are also naturally talking about the state where it is state missionary. Uh, and if I may extend it to talk about a certain Indian nationalism that, you know, tries to protect the caste order that tries to because anybody who is talking about uh, you know uh, dalit assertion or let's say dalit political space or you know uh, just the right of dalits they immediately get branded as anti national so how is it that you know that if if to talk about dalit issues if to talk about you know all of these identitarian issues become anti national then what is it a national is your nas nation a construct that just holds up all of these systemic oppressions, the oppression of women, the oppression of Dalits. And uh, so, you know, so how do you look at the way in which the Indian nation itself is defined in terms of, you know, this caste in its DNA, this caste supremacy in its DNA, and this, let's say, Hindu supremacy in its DNA? Because I believe that one of the ways in which the Bhima Koregao 16, but also uh, if we look at you know the kind of reactions that uh, Dalit resistance has had, it's constant. Either in some parts it's connected with the Maoist, and therefore you know it's uh, which is why like let's say a social movement like the Vidhala Chirutegal or the Dalit Tantas in Tamil Nadu Liberation Tantas had to become a political party at some point because you know they could not exist as a social movement because the police were constantly saying, oh, we're going to drive you underground. We're going to say that, you know, you're doing things. So they had to kind of mainstream themselves and becomes a part, become a party, you know, political party. So what I wanted to say is that how easily is it to dismiss Dalits as anti-nationals and why has it been happening for so long? I wanted to hear other people's comments on this. So, Well, if I if I may just comment on this, I think uh, I sort of alluded to this in my uh, uh, initial uh, moment also. I yes, think yes. We we just need to look at the the cast composition of uh, of the media. Like you know, I am I applaud uh, Nihal uh, raising the point about the Disharavi versus Nadeep Kaur and Shiv Kumar case. I remember reading the morning headlines, you know, like Disha Ravi's mother, like her tears are there. It, it was like reading a very poetic kind of prose. And, and uh, Nadeep Kaur and Shiv Kumar were relegated to page three, you know, in the bottom half to column reportage. Now, um, coming from like my, my training is in media. So like for me, this is very obvious form of framing and priming, which is going on about the need uh, about the new thing and it's very difficult to pinpoint because if you catch the journalist or the editor they'll say look we covered that also so it can't just be about whether you're covering stories it's also about how you're covering stories what words you're using where you're placing them how much space you're giving them and uh, like i mentioned that you know uh, uh, many scholars have pointed out that for the last 3000 years the biggest power uh, uh, hegemony system in South Asia is caste. So you can have, uh, it, it is big enough to have people who can be on different political spectrums, who have disagreements on policy, who have disagreements on tolerance, who have disagreements on what the nation is and what uh, secularism is. But when it comes to caste, their solidarity is very neatly aligned. So I think that's the, you know, the, 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 I think the simpler answer, the short answer as to why is it that, you know, when a uh, Dalit or a Bahujan organization starts organizing and starts mobilizing, it's Im immediately criminalized, it's threatened, it, it faces a kind of hostility, you know, just the hostility in perception, like the other, like some, some kind of a nefarious organization that you will not find when when you know uh, upper caste liberals start you know circulating petitions and things like that so i think a lot of it you know if we strip away the layers in my opinion we can just look at the the caste composition who's the editorial class uh, of the mainstream media if we just look at you know who's the who's the decision making caste of the legal apparatus I think that point has also been raised about, you know, access of legal aid, uh, you know, and why is it like that? Of course, we, we kind of can read it in caste sense in a lot of ways, right? You know, it, it, it comes, it manifests itself in all of these uh, forms. 
Yes, um, th th thanks for this, um, thanks for your intervention, um, Mr. Intellectual. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to, you know, uh, draw upon this and uh, also talk uh, in terms of BK um, about the fact that uh, it's, it's quite worthy of commentary that uh, they have now started, in a sense, you know, uh, there was this report called Broken People published by the Human Rights Watch more than 20 years ago. I think it was a report published by uh, Smita Narula from 1999 or something, like, more than 20 years ago, on which it talks about, it really documents the way in which, which Dalit activism, especially in Tamil Nadu, has been criminalized routinely and the kind of cases that they filed on the scatter. But I want to talk like how they somebody like Hani Babu, who just stands for Dalit Bahujan reservation policies in Delhi University gets implicated in this case. Or someone like Dr. Anand Tepte, who is an intellectual. And why, I, I just want us to wonder out loud, because on the one hand, uh, we see that, um, you know, what a Dalit has to say on labor rights, nobody bothers about what Dalit politicians have to say or that. They don't, want, they don't bother about what Dalit politicians have to say on the budget. They are only interested in Dalit politicians when a Dalit atrocity occurs. But at the same time, why are they going after you know Dalits in the cultural sphere, Dalits in the intellectual sphere, Dalits in the artistic sphere? So this was a question that I wanted to kind of throw it open to the floor as well. I we can understand why lawyers are doing Tell me. I, I somehow feel like you know uh, uh, they they you know make us militants or you know our descent a militant descent because you know. Somehow, I, I think, you know, they are afraid that, you know, we might do things, you know, similar to what they did to us. But, you know, I don't think that, you know, we, we really want to do this. The, the Dalit movement is not about, you know, bringing disturbances or breaking the country. The Dalit movement is all about, you know, peace and love and equality. And, you know, these can be achieved only when we will, you know, understand the problems and, and we are the people who are just you know pointing out the problems now why Anu, dr anand tumle is dangerous is because you know he's writing texts like republic of caste because when you go to the book when you read the book you you understand the, the deeper complexities and deeper pervertness of the society of this indian society and i think this uh, somehow you know maybe you know they are afraid of you know that you know these this system will be something you know which will which will break the country or something like that but i don't think that it is going to break the country because the country is breaking day by day when you know when a lot of protests are you know rising up from from different places you know around different issues you're breaking the country in that way not not the way you know that like if somebody's writing something you know they're not breaking the country you know you like united states have you know given uh, a lot of space to a lot of communists you know a lot of communist literature has you know uh, yeah, ha has been written in the united states and they are very anti communists so why can't that happen in india you know in india you know some things are just you know tagged as something you know like uh, you know communism is, is just bad you know people without you know reading a communist manifesto or you know uh, reading karl marx just say something like that same thing happens with you know our literature they do not read you know like when i see in the hindi belt you know, they do not really read, uh, you know, Om Prakash Valmiki or somebody like that. They would, you know, they would make their perspective based on on what Prem Chand has had to say. So, you know, they still are into this, you know, uh, uh, I do not know why do they not want to really read us because if they will read uh, Republic of Caste, it is not, a you know, a manifesto of making militants. It is a critique about about uh, about about the the, the, the the country which we call Republic of India. So I think, you know, that is also there, you know, I, I think, you know, they, they, they still do not consider us uh, intellectual enough or, you know, artistic enough to be heard or to be seen or to be noticed. Uh, th thanks, thanks uh, for this, Desh. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, and there was one more question that um, actually, originally, I think Buffalo Intellectual highlighted, but I think, I wanted to bring it towards the end of this also to talk about even as much as you know it could uh, it could be complicated the caste nature of the judiciary you know when because there is a certain way in which it has been one of these institutions that uh, their decision making once again goes back into the you know 
we keep saying is the constitution in effect or is the manusmriti in effect but also it's not only the manusmriti but it's also the people who are regarded as the priestly class by the manusmriti the brahmins who once again are the ones making judgments here like i recently saw that some B B um, some ex judges from kerala high court joined the bjp and one of them has openly said that you know a, a twice born is uh, the one who has to become a judge so um, uh so i wanted to you know talk about this but also i we got it getting some questions from the audience and i want to take one of them how does the rtl case affect your litigation strategy and i think it's a very important one uh this is more where uh, how do you please answer us and we are we are really also eager to know how the pk is going to go forward uh see how it is going to affect uh or how it is going to benefit us in the coming days is uh better left uh, uh for us to see in the time to come uh but where it places the case in legal parameters is something that i can uh, definitely share uh see the whole case of prosecution or, or the state was that this legal this these people the 16 people in totality were conspiring in uh, with cpr maoists to carry out anti national activities to procure arms or to assassinate prime minister and all these things and this whole case was based on uh, what they claimed to have found in the computer of uh, rona wilson and surendra gadli and uh, of course uh, uh, another computer that seized from uh, varavara rao has uh, 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 supposedly broken down to the extent that now they need to take it to fbi for its examination so uh, they they are claiming that all this material was found from the computer of rona wilson and surendra gadli now the arsenal report uh, very scientifically gives out data as to how this uh, tampering with the uh, machine has happened and uh, with that report in our hand uh, uh, which has not as in the, that that particular aspect has not been touched by uh, government forensic labs uh, which they were duty bound to do and uh, that has not been done and left out from the consideration now uh, Uh, rather uh, becomes complimentary and uh, arsenal report points out that this data is completely unreliable because the computer was not in actual uh, control of the person who it, who it belongs to so that way the they hold we cannot hear you hello your voice is low that yeah yeah now no <laughs> yeah it's just, just the volume is yeah, low it's like shouting maybe it will reach out yeah ah oh, yeah dead dead <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, i was saying from 22000 pages charge sheet to no uh, evidence at all uh, is what does what this arsenal report does and uh, secondly what uh, we've been saying since beginning is uh, that the case depends completely on documents on on something that is written on piece of paper uh, if we have to go and accept that as an evidence then any novel written uh, in which someone uh, has conspired to kill someone has killed Uh, even that fictional account can become an evidence, and the person will have to be convicted by identifying who that character is. So uh, now that also falls apart uh, with this evidence. But the thing is, uh, we we have to follow certain process or certain procedure. And as we know, in Indian uh, uh, justice delivery system, a process is bigger killer than uh, uh, than than the punishment itself. So. Uh, uh, it does put our case in a, a, a much better position. uh and i hope uh, if i could intervene we will be uh i will be able to uh, obtain some relief uh some some interim relief at least if not complete caution
so our uh, moderator uh, has gone uh, our moderator has left us so i'll read out a question for vipala intellectual i think vipala intellectual can read the question and answer yeah. <laughs> all right uh, so i think there was a question which says uh, we see privileged people like pn krishna who is uh, well basically who's dissenting not only against the current government but also on caste issues in general and in the music industry so do you think activism of this type is the right direction um well i would read it in two ways one it is obviously good that you know somebody is raising uh, uh, commentary on caste uh, not just about a uh, caste diversity but in general but at the other level i also would read it in a cautionary way because there is a lot of vocabulary appropriation you see for me raising voice is not enough the real question is what have you done like you're a person who's a mainstream celebrity you have certain social clout you have social media clout you're uh, uh, socializing with important people you have some privileges and some pull so what structural change have you done have you influenced hiring have you promoted or platform people have you funded people have you helped them legally in legal defenses have you influenced policy have you done anything beyond quote unquote raising voice on social media you know it's you're welcome to raise those tweets i will retweet them you know if i have to and applaud that but you know what have you done beyond this raising this so from personally for me these mayor statements isn't good enough and it's like a it's like too much of uh, applause for some people who are beginning to learn that they need to unlearn you know for me that's like you know like why are we applauding these baby steps good you're tweeting that's a basic thing as a decent human being you should be doing you need to do way more than that so um, and i also feel it is very difficult for uh, oppressor caste liberals to not see themselves as messiahs they have too much privileges and uh, you know they always feel like you know they're doing everybody a favor by talking about some things and the moment they get called out for it then they start like you know being very cynical and they bare their fangs and things like that so um, i don't know like my uh, my position on this would be good he's tweeting but we have to wait and see you know we have to see structural results not just raising the voices uh, year after year just tweeting so that's how i would respond to that mina we can't hear you Oh, sorry um sorry i was on mute uh closing remarks from all of you if that is okay with the panel uh because uh, i have two little children who need to be put to bed and <laughs> or it's a very it's a very difficult proposition my partner is not with me at the moment so and i literally had to beg a babysitter to come so so please can, you, can i ask the floor for you know closing comments and, uh, and i have a few more comments to add in the close uh who wants to go first santana do you want to go first uh, yeah um well i would just like to thank everyone for this discussion because i believe that it's only these conversations um that will actually you know bring about an actual uh, process of change or if you know it will start a process of change um and in terms of yes um we have to realize that we uh you know the the caste struggle and and the oppressed have have been fighting to to voice and to um break out of their oppressive mindsets for for a very long time and i believe it is these conversations it is it is it is working on the tracks that we've been working on it is uh, accessing spaces that we are attempting to access um and and uh, actually honestly just saying what truly comes to our mind to be able to uh, move on from here and 
yeah, hopefully see some transformation, um, transformation in the, in, the, in the Indian legal system, in the way the Indian legal system functions, in the way we actually truly implement human rights in this country, and in, in, in the academic discourse when it comes to caste politics and the lit bhojan politics. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this comment, Santana. Uh, before I invite anyone else, uh, I just want to say something, which is that Bimala uh, Korigao, as much as you know what what is happening, uh, I think earlier um, Sidesh was talking about it and others as well, is that we have not had the necessary outrage that this kind of a case should have. The kind of systematic, you know, denial of rights, people have, Father Stan Swami having to fight for this, uh, you know, a super, the fact that uh, somebody, two people who are over 80 years old had to fight two years for one of them to get bail, the fact that, um, you know, uh, somebody like, uh, literally anybody, Sudha Bharadwaj is in jail, or Shomasan is in jail, and the fact that Corona was going on, Dr. Anand Tilpinde was in jail, nobody cared about what would come of them, and I think that that there is a certain way in which you know we talked about can this uh do we allow performative wokeness uh or do we allow you know people from oppressor backgrounds to talk but i also think we need enormous outrage on a case like this uh, which i feel might turn the tide because uh, these things cannot uh, be undone you know like so i do believe that uh, even getting um, political support has not been enough in this case. So there has to be something more larger, I think, that coming from around the people. So uh, we have to keep outraging and, you know, we have to keep Bhima uh, Korega uh, burning every single day because, you know, the media gets distracted. There's an IT raid on Tapsi Panu and, you know, Anurag Kashyap and like that's all we bother about. And then like, oh, no, the best, the best minds in this country are in jail for two years. Like, when are they going to be out? So I think that, you know, we have to keep the heat on and do everything with the heat on this case. Those are my five. Like someone else to close this meeting with something more positive and more optimistic and more militant, if possible. Any one of the other panelists, please? I think Nihal would be best for this. Yes, Nihal, please. You're directly involved in this, please tell us. It's positivity only which has kept us alive in past three years, I think. Uh, but I would say, uh, uh, if we don't want this uh, figure of BK-16 to go to figure uh, BK-20, BK-100 and all, uh, we have to uh, we have to arrange uh, for every day these people have screened behind bars. We have to arrange for the uh, torture they have suffered, the harassment they have suffered, their families, uh, the society in totality has suffered. We must, uh, you might identify these perpetrators and and avenge what has happened. We can't just uh, sit quietly after uh, winning this case or after getting some relief. The fight must continue till the time we win and that victory would be to have that society these people have been fighting. Mm -hmm. That's from myself. Uh, Sorry. Does this freezing happen? Uh, I want to thank uh, Academy Mag for hosting this conversation, for making it happen. <laughs> just gone. <laughs> I think she has poor connection. Shall see you guys. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, nice. Bye. 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 Bye.